Now, as I travel around, I ask people this question, do you love your city? And people who would come here, a guy who's written a couple books about loving their city, chances are they do love their city. And I suspect that all of you, by the fact that you're here today to participate in this symposium, you do love your city. And you'd like to believe that's a commonly held notion. And maybe amongst the people that you hang out with, your friends, your family, maybe that's true. But the sad truth is, is that not nearly enough of us actually love our cities. So it is incumbent upon us, those of us who do love a place, we need to be the emotional standard bearers and carry that message out there into the city and get our fellow citizens to see and feel the city the way that we do. Because remember this, emotions are contagious. You smile, I smile. You cry, I'll feel bad. And when more people start saying they love their city and, and acting upon that, other people are going to see it, other people are going to feel it, other people are going to believe it as well. And maybe what we can do is we can create a positive cycle, that, that virtuous cycle, where things, good things compound upon good things. And all of a sudden now there's this sense, hey, there's something going on here. And that's actually something that Steve shared with me uh, uh, here just yesterday when I arrived. He's showing me around town and says, you know, there really is this sense of momentum, this sense of possibility that we are on the precipice of doing some really amazing stuff uh, here in Tulsa. And I'm sure you guys feel that as well. That is that emotion in the, uh, in the air, in the water, as it were. So as I travel around, I ask the question of people. I says, okay, tell me about your place. Tell me what do, you, what do you like, what do you dislike, what do you love, what do you hate about your places? And of course, when you travel a lot, you'd expect to hear a pretty wide variety of responses, and I do. Um, but as I've traveled, uh, and I'm talking cross borders, cross nations, cross cultures, people are remarkably consistent about the things they say they dislike about their places, the things that they say they hate about their places, okay? So what do we hate about our places? Well, we hate things like traffic and parking, Bad education systems, bad planning, ugly design. Big, big problems that we spend tons of money trying to fix, and I'm not sure you ever truly fix them. At best, you're addressing the symptoms of those problems. And for most cities, nothing actually represents this more than the pothole. <laughs> Nobody likes potholes, right? And we as citizens, we complain to the city about the potholes. The city eventually gets around to fixing the potholes. And for most citizens, this is about their level of engagement with their places. Complain about the potholes, city fixes the potholes. Now, the truth is, is we could fix every pothole in Tulsa, we could fix every pothole in Oklahoma. And you, the collective citizens, would yawn, stretch and say, yeah, thanks, roads don't suck quite so bad. No love for fixing potholes. There is no emotional return on investment for fixing potholes. This is not to say we're going to stop fixing the potholes, but I think we can agree that maybe we should be aspiring to something more. And here's the tricky part. Our citizens know to ask for you to fix the potholes. That's a pretty obvious pain point. There's a hole in the road, my car's gonna fall into it, somebody needs to fix that. Our citizens don't necessarily know to ask for other things, like beauty and art and great design. That's not necessarily in their lexicon. But once they've seen it, once they've felt it, they go, how did I ever live without this? So we as leaders in a community, we need to intuit beyond what people are merely saying, which of course they're gonna tell you, hey, fix the potholes. Yeah, of course but there's other things that we aspire to as we build these better cities. So my partner Michelle and I were in Anchorage, Alaska. This would be about three Februarys ago. And we found this little downtown park, and uh, this is the remnants of their holiday ice sculptures down there. And one of the things that I thought this really illustrated was this importance of play. Because I think play is sort of central to our relationships with other people. You know, think about those unstructured, unplanned moments when you're hanging out with your friends and your family. Those are sort of like the bedrock of our relationships with other people. Well, we need opportunities to play with our cities as well if we have this relationship um, with our cities. So Michelle and I were walking around, we found this park, and obviously, obviously uh, this is their holiday ice sculpture remnants. Still, still quite cold in uh, Anchorage in February. So we found this, and we walk over here, and Michelle sits down at the end of this. And this little girl in yellow walked up and he goes, hey, you're in my spot. Um, and we had to move. And when we moved, we found this. Now, city making point number two. You want people to make that face in your city. When people make that face in your city, good things are gonna happen in your city. Not only are we gonna go back and tell folks, hey, we had a great time in Anchorage, Alaska. You know, we're gonna write some positive Yelp reviews, we're gonna put some fun stuff up on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We're gonna be in a good mood and we're probably gonna spend some money. And people don't make that face in your city when you fix potholes for them, no. They make that face in your city when you surprise and delight them. Surprise and delight, like fun, don't have to cost a whole lot of money, but they do need to be seen as legitimate objectives in the work that we do. And think about that. When was the last time you ever initiated a project with the goal of surprising and delighting your fellow citizens? Probably never. 
you know, uh, and that, that'd be a good day to go to work. It's like, yes, today I shall surprise and delight the fellow, my fellow citizens of Tulsa. That'd be a good day to, to come in and check in at the office. Um, and again, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money, because you know what she's sitting in? Frozen water. Frozen water, some creativity, some imagination, and thinking about the problem in a different way. Granted, frozen water is a little easier to come by in Anchorage, Alaska than it is in other places. Uh, nonetheless, there's always something lying around that if we thought about it in a different way, we might come up with some wildly fun and creative solutions uh, to, to make too surprising and delighting our fellow citizens. And I started with a tree and I thought I should end with a tree. And a couple years ago, I visited uh, New Zealand, uh, which is literally Middle Earth, uh, for those of you who are fans of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. And actually, I got to visit the set of Hobbiton, which is in a, a district called Waikato, near this little village called Mata Mata. And the story goes, this is actually the tree. And you guys, if, you, if you're fans of the, the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings uh, movies, this is the, the set uh, that was built, the outdoor set that is Hobbiton, where Bilbo and Frodo Baggins live there in the Shire. And the story goes that uh, Peter Jackson's um, uh, scout, location scouts, were scouring New Zealand looking for locations. And when they came across this farmland uh, there, they came across this tree. And this is a real tree. This was not a, you know, a Hollywood CGI kind of thing. This is the party tree uh, in the opening scenes in that. And once they saw the tree, they said they knew they had their shire because everything else they could build around that. But the tree itself was just so magnificent uh, there. And they built the sets. And this is Frodo uh, and Bilbo Baggins' uh, hobbit hole there in Bag End. Uh, and this is the, 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 uh, the tree. And now, after the movies, um, after the, the Lord of the Rings completed, they had, uh, the studio was going to come back in and pull down all of these sets. But people discovered that, oh, that's over in Mata Mata, let's go. And this farmer just started charging a little bit of money to, you know, oh, sure, go ahead, take a look. And it became this amazing tourist destination now. And now the whole, now it's become a permanent uh, destination or a permanent uh, fixture. The whole city, the whole area has now become infused with, you know, this sort of uh, tourists who are coming to essentially this farmland area that they'd never come to before. The downtown, the city of Matamata, Mata is also, they sort of sound, uh, it says Matamata Mata and it says Hobbiton under, underneath of it. And they've embraced this whole idea of that because of a tree because of something that resonated with people, something beyond uh, the, the ordinary uh, there. There's something that's not necessarily logical. And the thing about emotions, and I talked about emotions being contagious, emotions will take us to places that logic, sense, and reason alone won't allow us to get there. And that's the beautiful thing uh, about it. And you're going to hear all kinds of logical reasons why trees and why the green matters to us. And there's all kinds of, fan there's all kinds of fantastic data about that. You know, everything from, you know, from pollution, uh, phytomitigation of the better soil, runoff, all kinds of scientific and, and very logical reasons why trees matter. But I think beyond that, trees matter because they are living things that we have relationships with, clearly, that we resonate uh, with them as human beings. We have a symbiotic relationship with our green, and again, nothing represents green more than a tree. So I applaud Up With Trees and their effort uh, to make Tulsa an even better, more interesting, more lovable city. Well done, and thank you very, very much. <laughs>